nanohub.org. So, troubleshooting CV measurement. There's several tools available in our Kite software. We have offset correction, we have a great thing that we call confidence check, and we have status information. I'm not sure if I put a slide in here on confidence check. If not, I'll talk about it a little later. Um, troubleshooting means you need to ensure your proper settings, sweep delay times, test frequencies, AC drive levels, DC voltages. Make sure that you have the proper cabling, all cable links. Make sure your shields are connected as close as possible to the device. Ensure that you have a good device and proper contact to the device. One of the biggest problems we see are contaminated probe needles making poor contact to, to the device. So make sure your probe needles are clean and in good condition. In general, for making low and high capacitance measurements. For low capacitance, you use open correction. That also implies high test frequencies. Need to use the guard if applicable. And you need to use the appropriate current range. Let me make a comment on current range because we uh, developed some concepts of current range in this new instrument that, that weren't exactly done before. We actually allow three different current ranges, a milliamp, 30 microamp, and one microamp. The one microamp range is really a new range for an AC impedance instrument. Traditional AC impedance instruments didn't have a one microamp range. Maybe partly because it's really hard to get a one microamp range to work at 10 megahertz, right? So that is a very highly tuned, low current, wideband range. But because of that, the one microamp range tends to get a little bit slow, right? It's a very sensitive range, very low current. But in general, what I find is using the 30 microamp range gives me really good results. It's a fast range and it's very low noise. The 30 microamp range, I've seen results down to sub 50 atto amps on the 30 microamp range, even at a megahertz. So for myself personally, I almost always go in and choose one megahertz and the 30 microamp range and it covers such a broad spectrum of AC impedance and it does it so quickly with such low noise, it really works well for me. So you know, choosing the one microamp range, I really view it as a specialty range, and the one milliamp range is just for big, big capacitors. For high capacitance, short correction is very important, and as you go down in frequency, that will help you measure it. For higher frequencies, cables become more and more important the higher you go in frequency. <clears throat> now, we described the auto balance bridge and we described why this is so important in a multi-frequency AC impedance environment. But the auto balance bridge, you remember, actually has a feedback loop that goes and tries to drive that low terminal to virtual ground. But events can occur that might cause it to not be able to do that. Well, it's not going to sit there forever and try that to ground. It's going to try for a predetermined amount of time, and then it's going to go ahead and return to you a measurement, but it's going to return to you a status error that says the auto balance bridge was unlocked. What it said was, I couldn't drive it to as close to ground as I like, but I went ahead and made the measurement anyway, but be warned, because of that, I can't guarantee the results of it. So. Auto balance bridge unlocked errors occurs when it's unbalanced. Reasons mean the cable length may not be the same on CV terminals. Remember, this is a digital feedback loop. We're sensing with one cable and sourcing with another cable. And if those cables are of different length, you know, if they're radically enough different length, I get a phase shift that I can't deal with. If, as soon as the thing gets greater than 90 degrees out of phase, all of a sudden my feedback loop doesn't work anymore. And so if you have radically mismatched cable links, you can get a 90 degree phase shift on it and it can't lock. If your high potential or low potential terminals somehow got disconnected, let me make a comment on that. Because we taught you yesterday with a precision DC SMU that the sense terminals are auto sensing. You don't need to take any action with those. You can't program them on or off. And 
you know, if you don't connect them, it will figure out that you didn't connect them and it will compensate for it. With a CV meter, that's not true. The low pot, high pot terminals, which are the sense terminals, are required to be connected. They either have to be connected at the instrument, you run one cable out, or you have to run your sense cables out and connect them, but they have to be connected. There is no auto sensing element in an LCR meter or a Keithley CV meter. And so what we'll sometimes see is a sense terminal will come off the pad. This is particularly prevalent in um, some of the new nano probers, the really, the probers that can probe like 50 nanometer devices, okay? Um, so if a sense terminal comes off, you will get garbage results, you'll get ABB unlocked errors, that kind of thing. Make sure you hook up your sense terminals. If you have excessive noise on your low potential terminal, um, um, well actually that will cause the ABB to not unlock. In other words, if something's injecting current into the low terminal faster than I can compensate it in my digital loop, I won't be able to lock onto it. Okay. Um, if you're interfering, if, if you have other high frequency sources that are at the same frequency as the measurement, so one of the beauties of an auto balance bridge AC ammeter is that it is a lock-in amplifier. In other words, because I'm using DSP techniques, I'm looking at a very narrow band of signal, and that's only the signal that I injected, one megahertz, 100 kilohertz, whatever I injected, okay? That means I reject everything outside of that. I don't even look at it. But if somebody happened to be injecting one megahertz, some other instruments making a megahertz and is injecting it, that could come in on my measurement. It's non-correlated. In other words, I have no idea what its phase is or anything else, but it sits in my band. That could really create a problem. Now, how often does this happen? It doesn't happen very often. Usually when I see it is when I hook up two CD meters to one device trying to get you know, two sets of measurements simultaneously. Occasionally you'll see people try to do that and those two CV meters will beat off each other and they will, uh, will not be able to lock in and, and get the, uh, uh, the measurement. And if the stray capacitance on the auto balance bridge is too high, and I mean microfarads, then that will cause the auto balance bridge to not be able to drive that stray capacitance fast enough and it will unlock. So we created something in this instrument that we called the confidence check. So through our years of experience with doing uh, CV measurements, um, many times the question we would get is, how do I know this instrument is measuring what's really out there? Right? How do I know that it's measuring correctly? And so we created a set of tests called a confidence check. This is run from the same tools menu that you ran the open and short correction from. What the confidence check does is it goes out and sends a variety of signals out the high and low ports and, excuse me, looks at the return path, looks at the impedances, looks at a number of things out there to make sure you're cabled correctly. So when we say, when you run the confidence check, one of the first things we'll tell you to do is we'll say, lift your probes give me an open circuit and then I'll go out and I'll ping a whole bunch of stuff and I'll make sure your cables are connected, your sense cables are connected, your cables have the right impedances, you don't have too many reflections, you're not, you don't have shorted cables or open cables, okay? And then I'll tell you, set the probes down, give me a short circuit, right? And I'll go out and make sure the short circuit is appropriate. If any of those, if any, if I detect anything going on, I'll come back with a list of things and say, I detected this, 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 and this. Go here and look at this sense cable, or go look at this force cable, or do you have your cables connected correctly, or maybe your jumper wires aren't in. So I'll give you a list of troubleshooting things based on that, and I do it all based on open circuit and short circuit, okay? So that's the confidence check. So this is sort of my troubleshooting guide that we've come up with. If your capacitance is too high, your cabling or connection capacitance is affecting your measurement, perform the offset correction or minimize the capacitance in your system. Maybe you left the light on or you left the lid open. 
So, you know, uh, semiconductor devices are light sensitive. You put the light on it, it's going to generate carriers. That could look like a higher capacitive situation depending on your sample. So a lot of times we'll see people forget to turn the light off and the capacitance is higher than they think it should be, All right? You have unwanted capacitance from other terminals impacting your measurement. This actually kind of relates to that three terminal measurement we talked about. How much is that third terminal relating to my measurement? I can use guarding to get rid of that. I have a shorted dut. So how does a shorted dut make my capacitance look like it's too high? Well, remember capacitance, the amount of current that flows through a capacitor is related to the size of the capacitor. So a really big capacitor means I have a lot of current flowing. Well, if I put a short across there, that's a lot of current. That actually will be measured as a really big capacitor or a really low impedance. So if my capacitance is too low, well, maybe my device is not in equilibrium. Remember the example we showed where the device wasn't in equilibrium, we were in a condition called deep depletion, and that capacitance would be too low there. So you may need to, if you're doing equilibrium-based tests, increase your delay time. If you have poor or no contact to your device, your capacitance will look like it's too low. If your readings are down in the low femtofarad range and you're expecting picofarads, your probe's probably not making contact. So verify your connection. Or lift your probes and verify everything's working properly using confidence check. Uh, in the old days, we used to see a lot of problems between the backside of the wafer and the chuck. Uh, we would get a lot of people designing um, experimental devices where the backside of the wafer would wind up with some residual some, uh, oxide on it or something that they didn't go through the process of metallizing or degenerating the backside. So um, if you're doing a top side to chuck measurement and your capacitance is too low, make sure that the back side of your wafer is properly contacting the chuck. Make sure you've got good vacuum there. <coughs> Depending on the nature of your sample. What we used to do with silicon wafers is take a little DI water and drop it on the chuck and then set the wafer down on there and that kind of give you a degenerate condition on there. Gave a really good connection to the chuck. Sometimes you don't want DI water on your sample and it may not work for you. Uh, your dut appears to be open. Well, maybe it really is. Maybe you need to try another dut or run the confidence check and uh, make sure the cables are set up properly. Uh, your coax cable shields are not connected. That will result in a capacitance too low. Why is that? Well, because the coax cable shields, which are in the measurement, present an inductive loop. Inductance, for our model, is negative capacitance. Negative capacitance will subtract from what you're trying to measure, hence your capacitance will look too low. If your inductive loop is bigger than your capacitance, you will actually measure negative capacitance. See it all the time. So we have noisy measurements. We have a noisy device or environment. Yeah, okay. Sometimes we need to use quiet mode or custom mode to reduce the noise, but the truth is we really want to go find the source of our noise, all right? Maybe our dud is not shielded electrostatically. <clears throat> Usually this is not an issue from the measurement perspective. In other words, my measurement's locked on to my frequency, and it's very narrow band, so I'm rejecting all the other noise. But electrostatics can come in and hit your device and cause your device to move around, which I will measure as capacitance noise. So it's not noise on the measurement, it's noise on the device caused from having an unshielded device. You get tails on the end of a CV sweep. So you have a nice CV curve, but at the beginning or the end of it, it does, it loops up or loops down or does something that you go, it shouldn't be doing that. Why is it doing that? You know, that a lot of times that's the device either not in equilibrium or it's a very leaky device. If it's not in equilibrium, you know, use pre-soak voltage or delay times to get the device to equilibrium. If it's a leaky device, we get what's called the dissipation factor tail. So you remember that dissipation factor is the ratio of the real or leakage versus the reactive or capacitive current.
Well, as you increase the DC voltage, you get more tunneling and the device looks more and more leaky. So the device actually switches from a capacitive device to a resistive device. And so we get a smaller and smaller capacitive vector and a bigger and bigger leakage vector causing the, uh, the capacitance to be either become inaccurate or noisy. So that's why we always want to look at the real vector versus the capacitive vector and make sure that we're measuring in a realm that we have good results. Okay, so that really was the, uh, the end of my CV section. How are we doing for time? It's 11.15. We had planned to end at, I think, 11.30 for a lunch break, right? Oh, so we're right on, we're pretty much right on time. So, um, you know, we've got a couple of minutes that we could take a couple of CV questions if anybody wanted to uh, ask a question. If not, we'll break for lunch and we'll come back after lunch. We'll talk about ultra fast IV and transient IV for one hour and then we go to the lab and actually make some measurements. Any questions or comments? Yeah, we have. Yes, well, I mean, oftentimes we have leaky devices, especially right. when we are dealing with dots that uh, they have small capacities. Right. Uh, what do you usually do? I mean, if you look, for example, the dissipation factor, the, the traditional view is anything which is higher than 0.1 dissipation factor, then you, you rule out that the measurement is, is a good number. What, what did you do to deal with leaky devices? Because it seems that when you fabricate the device, you, you can avoid that they are actually leaky. In this, in this equipment, it seems that the way to solve the problem would be only to go to very high frequencies, and that's it. But uh, can you comment on, on that? Is some drawbacks on uh, shooting the, the frequency too high? Uh, how else do, will you deal with the uh, leaky devices? Okay. So to repeat the question for the microphone, in case it didn't pick it up, um, you're saying we have some devices that are leaky devices, small devices with high leakage. And um, how do we deal with that? So if you look at, at the specifications on a traditional AC impedance meter, the specifications say for dissipation factor less than 0.1. And in fact, Keithley specification is written at the same place. Okay. So as dissipation factor goes up from that, a dissipation factor of one means I've got an equal amount of resistance leakage and an equal amount of capacitance. So I have equal vectors. A dissipation factor of 10 means I got 10 times more leakage than I do capacitance. So one way that we deal with that is to raise the frequency that lengthens the capacitance vector making it easier to measure, okay? But going up in frequency brings other problems. As we've just discussed, you get cable problems, compensation problems, ground loop problems, or what's more common is we usually wind up with substrate or contact resistance. We wind up with a multi-element model where we have capacitance in parallel with resistance leakage in series with resistance. So as we mentioned earlier, if you've got a series capacitive resistive element, going up in frequency makes it worse. <laughs> okay. So going up in frequency doesn't always deal with the problem. All right. That's an easy way to do it, but it doesn't always work. What the problem really is, is the length of our capacitance vector is small compared to our total measurement. That creates two problems for me. One, it's a small vector, so it can be noisy. My signal to noise ratio is bad. But really, the noise is something we can deal with. We can filter it, we can increase the integration time, right? We can deal with the noise, right? Remember, we've got seven digits of resolution, right? We can really deal with the noise. The real problem is the phase error. So if I've got a really short vector, that means I've got a very small phase vector. And if I have a very small error on that phase vector, so if you think about it, what's really happening as I sweep the DC voltage, my capacitance vector is sweeping or my net vector is sweeping, right? It sweeps from a high, the low dissipation factor to a high dissipation factor. So if I've got a small phase error, that fixed small phase error becomes more and more and more significant as I sweep toward a, a leakier condition. 
So what happens is you'll see the capacitance develop a huge tail. It'll either tail way up or it'll tail way down depending on which direction the phase error is. All right. So if I had some way of correcting that phase error and knowing that it's proper out there, I could actually eliminate those tails. So that's one problem. The second problem is phase noise or phase jitter. So remember that I'm measuring voltage and current and I'm trying to measure the phase between them. So on old analog systems, I used to get phase jitter on that. But this is a fully digital system where I've got two digitizers that are phase locked to each other. I have no phase jitter. So there is no phase noise in there, at least not inherent in the instrument. So the real problem is, and I contend that we need to do this, we haven't done it yet. If we could come up with a phase source at the probe tips, that I could calibrate the meter to that phase source at the probe tips such that I knew the phase was correct, then I could measure dissipation factors of 1, 10, or even 100. On this particular instrument, I've actually measured a dissipation factor of 100 at the cables themselves because I can put a calibration capacitor of known phase at the cables. But it's different at the probe tips. So, um, at present, there is no phase calibration in this instrument, hence it has the same problem as all our instruments. When you get to a high D condition, you'll start to get a roll up or a roll down. Fortunately, the noise will be much better. We've dealt with that in this system. But if we could find a way to come up with a phase correction, then I think that we could deal with that high D problem. Now, we have an application engineer at Keithley that came up with a mathematical phase correction for it to correct this. And it's, it's a very interesting correction, it actually works pretty well, but it's really just an empirical correction. It really isn't based on actual measured results. Oh. Okay. It's a great question. The high dissipation factor question has been uh, a serious issues for at least five or six or seven years now, right? Okay, anybody else? Oh, we have one. Uh, I have a metal question. How, how often do you think uh, we need to calibrate the capacitors with a high quality capacitors? Okay, please repeat the question. Uh, I mean, how often do you think uh, we need to calibrate the capacitors, straight capacitors, or cable correction? Okay, the question is how often do we need to perform open and short correction? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. So the, the reality is open and short correction are correcting the cables and the probes, right? If your cables and probes don't change, the system really doesn't drift. I mean, there's a small amount of inherent drift in the system. Yeah, it drifts a little bit with environment, with temperature and stuff. But the truth is that's down at the PPM levels. In most cases, you'll never even see that. So if the system doesn't change, the cables and the probes don't change, you don't need to reperform open and short. Okay. Um, However, in many cases, it's a multi-user system. So you might walk up to the system and not know what the condition of it is. You don't know how somebody left it before. So you may want to perform the open and short just to make sure you put it in a known state. The uh, confidence check is really good for that too. You walk up to an unknown system, you run the confidence check, it'll tell you how well the system works. That's a great question. Um, this is like, okay, so if you use a panel model to measure your capacitance and you get to this limit sometimes where the resistivity of your bulb kind of adds up like that three element model you have on there. Yeah. How do you uh, correct for that? How do you find out how much that series uh, impedance in the bulb is? So the, the I'll repeat the question. The uh, question is we have a device that has some uh, parallel capacitance and resistance in the device itself, but the way we connect to the device includes some parasitic resistance. Maybe we have to connect through the bulk or through some path up to another pad that goes through a semiconductor. How do we determine the resistivity of that third element? Okay. There's actually been a lot of papers written on that. Um, Really, it requires a second frequency. So 
you have to have some knowledge to begin with. You have to have something that allows you to spin down into your sample. So if you take and, and create a model that says, I think my capacitance and parallel resistance is this, and then um, I measure that with two frequencies, based on that model, I can extract what that resistance is, that resistivity is down in the bulk, right? If I throw a third frequency at it, and try to apply that model and it doesn't fit, that means the model that you chose initially for your first two elements wasn't correct. Therefore, the resistivity that you pulled out for your resistivity also wasn't correct. And now that you have a third frequency, you can actually go back and mathematically extract what the correct model probably is. So once you know one of the elements you know your resistivity of your substrate will be sitting within this regime, then you only need two frequencies to pull all three elements out. But if you don't actually know what this resistivity is, you might need three frequencies in order to spin down on the model. I would have to think that one through a little bit more. Now, if you look back in the literature, for example, I think it was Napoleon that gave us a uh, a model that said, well, if I bias to accumulation, then it tells me what my model is for my capacitance and my resistance when I bias to accumulation. And I can shrink the resist or increase the resistance to infinite. Right. If you would an accumulation, it just give two resistance to the side. I'm sorry, say a little louder. If you had accumulation, then you would say that. Oh, the capacitance just can be ignored. Is that what you're saying? If you're in accumulation, what I'm saying is, um, well, what Nicolian said was, when I'm in accumulation, that I know the capacitance is the only thing that I'm looking at. So Nicolian's model actually didn't take into account leakage. It basically said, if I'm in accumulation, I know that I'm not looking at any effects in the bulk. Therefore, I'm in accumulation. Everything that I measure in the bulk is real, and I will use that to correct the entire curve. That's the, the three element model, the uh, conductance compensation that Nicolian proposed. But that, that, that had several simplifying assumptions in it that probably don't hold true anymore, particularly now that our oxides and, and our layers underneath our oxides have gotten much more sophisticated. So really what needs to be done is you need to you need to develop in your head kind of what the model is and then use more than two frequencies to try to verify that model. Once you verify it, two frequencies is enough. That's a great question.